so now we're uh, back to our keynote presentation. And the topic is understanding the tension between Indigenous community education aspirations and language education policy. And delivering that keynote is Dr. Kevin Lau. And he is a Gubby Gubby man from the Southeast Queensland. He is currently a Scient Scientia Research Fellow at the University of New South Wales, where his research has looked at establishing a community-focused, whole school model that will underpin sustainable improvements in Aboriginal education. He has an expertise in developing Aboriginal language policy, curriculum development, and its implementation. Recently, he has worked with Aboriginal students and parents to understand their aspirations for the wider inclusion of language and cultural programs in schools and a review of all recent Australian research on effective school-based Indigenous language and programs. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Lowe to the podium. Um, delegates, thank you so much for <clears throat> coming on this last day and uh, spending just a few moments with me and giving me an opportunity, I guess, to bring to you, I guess, a, a perspective from Australia. Um, this has been an amazing three days and, uh, or two and a half days, and I've listened to extraordinary presentations and um, I guess none other than, of course, my very good friend, Professor Lorna Williams, who I, I haven't heard a word yet who hasn't, someone hasn't said to me, what an amazing presentation. So few slides, so few words on screen, and so many great thoughts. I want to talk to you about um, the work that I've been doing, and, and I guess trying to sort of give you some perspective from an Australian perspective of where things are in terms of language and our work in culture. And it's trying to understand, I guess, the tensions between what our aspirations are for language and culture and where the state constantly takes us in terms of policy and practice. And trying to unpick how it is that we end up getting railroaded and often get taken down to dead ends and find ourselves in difficult situations where communities lose face and lose heart in terms of being able to move forward. So my name is Kevin Lowe, and I am a descendant from the Gubbi Gubbi people. I wasn't going to say this, but I just maybe, given what I've experienced the last few days, I should expose a little bit more about myself. Um, I was, uh, well, maybe I shouldn't, maybe it's too hard. I was going to say that um, when I was two, I was taken from my mother. And um, I spent a, whole, a lot of years in foster care. And um, when I was about seven, my grandmother came and found where I was and stole me away from the foster parents who were, I can't say they were bad people, but they certainly weren't loving. And I spent uh, the next four or five years traveling the highways and byways of remote Australia. My, gr my grandmother was a commercial traveler. This is in the 50s when people went out to properties and sold goods to farmers on remote stations and farms. So to say I had a fractured primary school education um, you know, would, wouldn't, give, uh, wouldn't be far off the mark. So I, it's interesting, here I am, at, I'm now almost 70 and I, I'm back at university working and teaching our students at university. So it's been a long, a long journey for me.
I want to thank you for the uh, Tracy and the First Peoples Council for this incredible, generous invitation to address you on the final day of this amazing international conference. And like everybody else here today, I'd like to start my talk by acknowledging the traditional owners of this amazing land. I love coming here. And I acknowledge and respect the Lekwungen speaking peoples whose traditional unceded territory this conference has been held. And the Songjis, the Esquimalt peoples whose historical relationship with this land continued this day. I pay my respects to your elders, past and present, and all of those who are connected to this country and to all other Indigenous people. And especially I want to also acknowledge those non-Indigenous people who are here in the room with us and who have travelled this path for so long. It's on the back of your work as well as our own that we have got to the point we are today. I want to bring greetings to you from far away from my elders and my kinfolk. On behalf of them and myself, thank you for the hospitality and your friendship. Restoring language to our communities is the purpose for this meeting. And I want to thank you for honouring me with your presence to hear about our journey and the great common task that we have together. Thank you. I've put in front of you two maps that I guess um, give some sense of where I'm from. The, uh, the hand printed map is one which I found in an old document and it relates to the traditional country of my great grandmother and grandfather just north of Brisbane. And I wanted to, um, in a sense, give you some sense of where it was and where I've come from, because I know that a lot of people say, I'd love to go to Australia, but it's just so far away. It's a t and it is. <laughs> it's, it's 15 hours in the plane. So, uh, mind you, I did, I did meet the most amazing man from Papua New Guinea who came here. And if you've had the chance to speak to Stanley, I'll please take the opportunity to hear of his, his journey of a land of 8 million people and 870 languages. An extraordinary, I can't even believe the, the uh, sheer size of the, the task. So this is me, this is where I come from, this is my family's home. It stretches from the northern side of Brisbane, which is the capital of Queensland, to the north of, to Maryborough, and it's just west of Fraser Island, and Fraser Island is the largest sand island in the world. It's just off the coast of Queensland. Our name is Garai, which means the world, to us it meant paradise, the land of rainforests, the lands of white beaches, the land of extraordinary abundance. I wanted to put this slide because in a sense of some comparisons, and it's just not a matter of trying to, to make comparisons, but in a sense to give you some sense of the place that I've come from. I know that these figures are very elastic and they get pushed back all the time, but currently even the white people in our country are here to tell us that um, Aboriginal people have continu had continuous occupation of Australia for 65,000 years. To give some sense of that, I've worked out that basically that's almost 2,500 generations. White occupation of Australia is six generations long. And in those six generations, of course, they've completely, as far as we're concerned, destroyed the country that we had occupied for so long. In our country, we have 250 discrete languages, two completely different language groups, 700 dialects. At the present moment, there's around about 770,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. We make up about 2.5% of the population. 
The largest population is in New South Wales, my home state. While the largest actual percentage of the population is in the Northern Territory, where Aboriginal people make up 26% of the population. I put the map up there because in a sense, it, I want to show that there wasn't one square inch of that country that Aboriginal people didn't occupy. Not one inch of that place where we hadn't walked over that land in that 65,000 years. I came across this amazing quote from one of our beautiful aunties, Auntie Val Coombs, and she said, white fellas like theorising where we came from, from somewhere else than Australia, to lessen our connection to country. They're always trying to show us where we supposedly came from, related to India, or we related to the Mel Melanesians, or we came from Indo Indonesia or somewhere. But she said, our knowledge of our, of our history is embedded in the blood of our country. Whitefellas' knowledge of our history is only as good as their technology. They'll never understand our connections to land. It's been, I guess, a long introduction, but I'm interested in this question of morality. I'm interested in the morality or the immorality of the colonial state and its relationship with its indigenous people. And I want to come back to this towards the end, in a sense, to try to pull this all together. But that's my common theme. I've tried to understand why it is that, that non-Aboriginal Australia, through its governments and through its laws and practices, thwart us at every moment when they've given an opportunity to go a right direction or a wrong direction, to us they choose the wrong direction. And I've always thought, what is it that that hap How does that happen? What makes this to be the case? And it's taken me a long time to realise that at the heart of this is this hole in the heart of not Aboriginal Australia. It's about the morality of their own sense of being in this land which they know they were, they were stolen from us and the fact that they've never come to terms with that immoral act lessens their own moral standing and their own capacity to make good moral decisions. So what I, I'm going to do in the next few minutes is to talk about how these things come to be. When I finished my doctoral work, which was in school community engagement, I was interested in how schools and communities engage with Aboriginal people. I said that I would take on the task in three years of trying to uh, establish a new way of thinking about how Indigenous education could work for Indigenous people in Australia. To set that task, I, I set out to talk to as many Aboriginal elders and families and children about the schooling that they receive. I wanted to recognise the realities of our communities. I wanted to hear directly from the, from the words of the students themselves of what schooling was like, how they understood it on a day-to-day -day basis, what they understood of the publicity that swirls around their education, and how they internalise that and make sense of it and construct their own sense of success at school. But before I do that, I also wanted to say to you that um, I guess one of, the, one of the things I've heard over and over again is of this amazing success of what happens here in Canada. And I, think, and I feel quite depressed about where I think we are at the moment. Just a few statistics. 44% of all Aboriginal students in Australia or in my state live in one-parent families. 35% of those students live with a single non-Aboriginal parent. 20% of our students grow up either away from parents and they're ten, 10 times more likely than non-Aboriginal students to be in custodial care. Aboriginal students, or Aboriginal children, make up 70% of all children in juvenile justice. 70%, although we only make up 2.5% of the population. It's an extraordinary. It's more likely that a student will end up in jail than they will by, to complete school. 
I, I raise those figures because it's, it's, I'm talking about the fragility of identity, the fragility of our access to culture. So I set out to talk to students about themselves and their families and where they thought their lives were going and what they would make of them being an Aboriginal student. Oops, can I go back one? Sorry. So this was the project that I set out in the first instance, was to talk to students One of the things that came up over and again from these students was that they talked about being Aboriginal. And uh, it's interesting, I thought I had an email from uh, one of these um, non-Aboriginal 18-year-old students that I'm teaching, and they said, why, are, you know, I had a guest lecturer, and he, she said, why do you complain about being called Indigenous? What's wrong with that? And um, how, do you, how do you write a, an email on an iPhone with, with your thumb and try to give sense to that question and so I sort of mused at it. I didn't respond to it for several days. I don't know what she thought I was doing, but anyway, I finally just decided I would write her a response. The point of that is, is that Aboriginal people in this, our country, and I, I since around the world, have always been otherised. They've been pushed to the margins. They've been collectively brought together as a group because governments can... It's a way for which they can actually deal with us as an individual amorphous group of people as opposed to independent sovereign people. But I had all these students and I would, I would go in and I introduced myself to these students when I, was in, when I was doing the interviews and I said, say to them, so here I am, my name's Kevin Lowe, I'm a Gabby Gabby person, this is where I come from, this is my family. And I went around the room and I'd say, so where are you from? And over and over and over again these students would say, I don't know. I don't know where I'm from. Mum wants me, mum, you know, says I'm Aboriginal, but I don't know what that means. And so it was a real awakening to get a sense that, and this wasn't just a, an isolated incident, but over and again these students would say this to me. So I was interested in, in how we could start to reach out to these students and actually make some sense of what their life would be like. When we analysed the, the data from these students, there were four key themes. I'm not going to talk about all of them, but there were two that, in particular that I really, were really resonated with me. The first one was about connectedness to culture. And the other one I want to talk to you about is about their sense of Aboriginal identity. I'm just going to pick the first of those. So the first of these is about connectedness to identity, and that was, who are the students we're talking about? So these students basically lived in urban and regional locations. They're often the second or third generations of students of country. So while they had some connections, they had some idea of where the country might be, they didn't know what that meant, and they couldn't actually sort of talk about who their families were. They had little information about their families and their connectedness to place, but they often spoke about a yearning to actually want to be connected. But they didn't know what that meant. And all they could talk about themselves as being Indigenous or being, Abri being Aboriginal. To be able to ascribe themselves to a tribe or to a clan or to anything that would remotely look like where they'd come from was almost an impossibility. They Three quotes there just give you some sense of what they were, what they were saying. But over and again, they talked about the fact that, that, that they didn't know what it meant to be anything other than being this Aboriginal person in this school. Oops, sorry. We talked about, with them about caring for students as culturally located individuals. And so we talk about this and we sort of say that how important it is to be culturally situated and how that gives them great resilience. But the participants argued for the school, what they talked about was the fact that they wanted the schools to actually 
provide opportunities that enhance their interactions with cultural practice. We're talking about schools where, you know, maybe a school of a thousand students where there might have been 70 or 80 Aboriginal students. There might have been 100 students. And the best thing that happened to them on a day-to-day -day basis was to participate in the local dance group, which happened only two days a week for one hour at each occasion. Yet every time we spoke to these students, the kids would bounce in and, and would talk about how significant their participation was in these events. At one of the schools, there was one of those extraordinary moments where it turned out that um, the teacher who was teaching the dance class was a fully initiated Torres Strait Islander woman. A primary school teacher was teaching in high school. She was basically in a position where she was, um, had come down to get a teaching job and she couldn't get one, so she was actually working as a dance, dance teacher in the school. And when, she, when we spoke to her, she said, I realised from the first moment they talked to me that they were yearning for culture, they were yearning to actually know something. And she said, I, I felt embarrassed because here I am as an initiated Torres Strait Islander woman, 3,000 kilometres away from where I live. But I had to tell them something. I had to give them some sense of what it meant to be Aboriginal, what it meant to be an Aboriginal person, to be an Indigenous person of the land. And for the first... I think the first 12 weeks, she said, I just spoke to them about that connection and what that connectedness really means. While we worked and did dance and we, and I, we were doing dance moves and the girls were really enjoying that, but really it was about trying to connect them to country. When we interviewed these girls, over and over again, they spoke about these opportunities and what they were learning through that opportunity. And it really resonated with me it was about a sense of wanting to actually get some sense of their authentic, their, all, their own authentic identity. What it actually meant to be an Aboriginal person. When they get up and they were asked to, in the school to get up and participate in certain events, what did that mean? What did it mean to be an Aboriginal person when they couldn't actually ascribe it to a particular group? So there's this tyranny of this sort of pan-Indigenous identity that we're stuck with. At the same time as I started um, this research, I realised that um, one of the things that really disturbed me was that as a teacher, I'd been teaching for 26 years in schools and now I spent 13 years doing curriculum work and I'd seen many policies being initiated and virtually nearly all of them were, were, were significant failures to our people. The promise of lifting our, our educational achievement was constantly being promised by government, and yet it was never being delivered. And while I was on his pathway of trying to think what, what, would, what we could we do to replace what was there, I didn't want to fall into the same trap of just using what I thought myself and go down the same pathway and make promises that I couldn't keep. So the first thing we did was we set out to actually do a scan of all the research in Australia across all these, these 10 areas there you can see. We wanted to really know what happens in schools from an Aboriginal perspective, from our perspective, to actually reanalyse all this material to find out what it really said about schools and schooling. So while we, as we, we did this, I was very lucky to find you know, 10 other non-Indigenous academics who likewise had been working in various parts of this, these areas of schooling and who worked with me to write these papers to do this research so that we could actually go back so the thing that's in the blue square, you can see in the centre of that circle there, that was the question I really wanted to know. What are the issues that affect students, Aboriginal students' success? How could I answer that unless I had some sense of what, what all the things that happen? You know what it's like if you're a teacher. When you close that door and there's 30 kids in front of you, all of these things impact on you all at the same time. So to make sense of that, I needed to be able to sort of, you know, bring this together to pull it together into some common sense of, of what's happened. Out of that, we found that there were sort of four key themes that came out of our research. Those themes talked about the importance of community involvement in language and cultural programs. So, one of, so I'm, what I'm going to do now is actually just pull out one of those papers so I, I did a paper on language and cultural work in schools. And what, what did this tell us? 
I started off by looking, there were, there were 1,400 studies that were part of my initial scan of the literature. And from that, I, I was able to bring that down to around about 60 articles, 60 studies that actually spoke directly to the influence of language and cultural programs on students. There were four themes that, that um, really resonated in the research. The importance of cultural involvement in language and cultural programs. How schools develop and implement programs in schools. How they go about doing that. The need for long-term aspirational planning and resourcing of programs and the impact of programs on schools. Again, I don't have time to go through all of them, but I just wanted to just raise some of the issues. The issue of Indigenous communities, of their communities. So some of this research, much of this research was done in Northern Australia. So you know that while in the top end of our country we have people who are still first, first language speakers, we have people who still live a semi-traditional life, um, people who are still living on country. Many of these students will know four or five languages. So English will be the third or the fourth language that they use. The, the language most commonly used is a Creole language. Their parents and grandparents will speak traditional language and some will be speaking a pidgin language as well. You can see that um, in terms of cultural connectedness, cultural connectedness resonated with the questions around how we fortify students and how we are able to um, bring relationships and evidence the improvements that students were able to get through their connections to their communities. When we spoke to these girls in metropolitan Sydney, again, while they came from very isolated family groups, they understood that there was a community around them and that they wanted to be part of that and they wanted to know how they would make contact with the people within their community and how the community would actually work with them. At the heart of this question was this, this notion of, of wanting to be and know about countries and actually know about their place and know about how that actually, what that actually meant to them. The impact of language and cultural programs um, and social enculturation of youth was a really important area that came through. The students talked about the impact of being able to participate in their language programs and the fact that it actually gave them a sense of belonging. The impact of language and cultural programs was a way in which they could actually then start to actually see that being Aboriginal, to be able to ascribe themselves as being other than this, this name, actually came with a culture and came with a view of the world. And they started to, in, while this was going on, they, they started, these students, you could hear that they were starting to understand the impact of colonisation. They understood the nature of dispossession. They started to talk about Year 7 kids, so I was talking to year tw so 12 year old students, who could start talking about it in a language where they started to realise the dispossession wasn't just a matter of white people coming along and moving in and putting fences around blocks of land, but it actually had these enormous social and cultural impacts on them. So you can see that for these students, the idea of being able to introduce a language program was almost an impossibility, and yet through the sort of their access to these programs. And in each case, they were dance programs that were being run by Aboriginal women who were starting to actually work with these students and talk to them about stuff that they had never heard before. So it was about, in a sense, while they were doing dance, they were talking and enacting notions of culture. Now, it's a long shot, of course, from what I saw yesterday when I saw their amazing dance group, uh, the you know, singing and language and, and enacting out. But it's a way in a sense of starting this conversation with these students. One of the things about the, the role of the school and school systems was that quite often schools um, made only half-hearted attempts to actually really understand what it was, the aspirations of the students that they had in front of them. Often the language, so the cultural programs are the programs that, that came in last and were the first to go. 
They were under-resourced and were never really part of a school curriculum. They were add-on parts to the things that were sort of meant to be something that would happen at lunchtime or after school. They weren't there to interrupt the maths and science classes. And yet they were the things that the students spoke about over and over again as being giving, giving them the sort of the, the impetus to get up in the morning and go to school. When dance classes were on the schools, the students said over and over again that they would come to school, it didn't matter how they felt. But the days that didn't have dance programs were the days in which they were more likely to not to turn up. You know, of course, that you know, students' absenteeism comes in two forms. There's the absenteeism or the physical absenteeism of not going to school, and then the absenteeism where students turn up but actually don't turn on. And it was when they were doing cultural programs that they really engaged with what was happening. And often, you know, we, we remember speaking to one of the science teachers, one of those sort of few teachers which really understood about the consequence of student engagement and co with culture. And he said the days they have danced were the days that the kids came into science or came into his class and were really switched on and really understood what was going on. I need to get going. I've got lots to say. Community involvement was... Um, communities looked to the schools to play a key role in supporting language reclamation. The parents said over and over again that they saw this, the school as being pernicious and destructive. In the past, schools had pl actively played the role of actually destroying culture and destroying our access to language. But they wanted also long-term commitments. They understood that while they, they, they would view the school with great suspicion, they also wanted the schools to actually step up to the plate and start to do something positive. And they looked for an authentic engagement with them. They spoke over and over again about this notion of authenticity, of actually sort of knowing when it was that they were actually being engaged in a real conversation. In terms of cultural programs, as, as I said, the schools felt that they were unable to support language programs, but, the, but they were able to support, in some degree, cultural programs that, that resonated with some elements of what was important. The impact on schools' social and cultural resilience you know, was significant. We saw this over and over again in students the research said over again that when students had access to these sorts of programs, that there was a greater degree of resilience in the students. They had greater capacity to be able to, to, to ward off, if you like, the, the impact of the things that were happening around them. An interesting comment that, that came through, especially from the schools in the Northern Territory, was that their access to language and cultural programs taught them how to live good ways, to be able to both be within themselves and the communities, to be good people, to actually learn to grow up to be good in terms of their cultural responsibilities. And we seem to have a positive impact on students being submersed in their culture and knowledge about the country. Being, being on country was significant. It was about, that's the place where they learnt to be Aboriginal. That's where they learnt to be who they were. In terms of their nurturing well-being. Students identified the evidence of improvements and so there were positive other positive benefits I guess for their involvement in language and cultural programs. Certainly the research tended to demonstrate that when students felt strong in their, their sense of economic, well, sorry, their cultural well-being that they also had positive spin-offs in terms of their economic success post-schooling. The students were more likely to complete school and to complete it and go on to further employment or further education. Just one slide quickly. Um, in New South Wales, my own state, you know, we've, we've now enacted both an Indigenous language policy and legislation. The notion of gammon, which is in a sense a way of us being able to sense, is this, is this a pretend policy? Is this a, a policy that, that resonates and says things to some people but not to others? What does it actually deliver? So while we've got a policy and a, and a legislation around these things, what has it actually delivered? It's, it's delivered us very few resources. It hasn't stepped up to the plate in terms of lang language planning, nor does it talk about language fluency. It talks about access, providing sort of limited access to language to some schools and some locations. So the promise, I guess, of policy, which supposedly resonates with all students, 
really in the end only gets played out for those students in those six or eight areas where language work is actually done. This is an, a map of, of my own state. So in New South Wales there's 50 languages, 70 dialects, only six languages which are seen to have the resources necessary to sustain intergenerational language learning, six out of 70. And in those uh, six language programs, there's presently 7,500 students who are attending on a regular basis language classes. So there is some efforts being made, significant efforts in small areas where language work is being undertaken. Most of those are in rural and more remote parts of the state. Some of the most successful ones are in the very smallest towns. In the last few minutes, I just want to now come back to the sense of, of policy and where we're up to. As I said, one of the things I was very interested in is how it is the policy gets written um, such that it promises, it uses the language that we understand, it uses the language that we think we understand, it uses words that we like to see, but often takes us down a very different pathway. So I did an analysis of these three policies. I just wanted to know how these things worked out, how they actually spoke to us and what sort of things did it actually play out. One was an overarching policy for all Indigenous work in our state, the New South Wales ochre policy. See, they, use, they, even, they even sort of, you know, take our words. The New South Wales Department of Education, Aboriginal Education Policy, and then the Connected Community Strategy. And I want to look at how those three policies worked. What was really interesting when we analysed these three policies is that while these policies sup supposedly were written to support Indigenous education, to bring about success for Aboriginal students in schools, it in fact had, had overseen uh, you know, virtually no improvement in outcomes. Over the, last, um, the last 12 months, $30 billion was spent in Australia on Indigenous seven areas of Indigenous Close the Gap strategies, $30 billion, and yet not one of those strategies could actually show any improvement. So where did all the money go? What did it get spent on? I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but in a sense to show that, that, that these policies, in fact, while they promised to do just some things, in fact, they delivered very different outcomes to us. One of the things that we saw when we did this policy analysis was that Aboriginal parents, people were seen as being themselves, we were, we were made the problem. And constantly, the, we were, our, our languages, our culture, our desires, our aspirations were seen to be as a deficit, as something that needed to be challenged and overcome. One of the things that really came out of this, this, this report that we did was that the government itself set itself up as our saviour. That we were so emasculated, we were so unable to move forward, we were so disparate and so unable to sort of see success for ourselves, our families were seen to be so weak that they needed to step in and be our saviours for us. So they actually wanted to take control of our language and cultures. They wanted to turn our language and culture as a way of actually doing what they really wanted. And when we really analysed this policy, what was it they really wanted us to do? They wanted us to get to work. They wanted to take us off welfare. They wanted us to become basically what they've always wanted, which was to assimilate us into the economy of the estate and to actually make us like everybody else. That was the purpose of that strategy. It was never about language and culture. It was about cultural assimilation and economic assimilation. We needed to do that work to actually understand what it does to us and understand that while we think that they're writing policies and strategies for us, in fact, they're wanting to do other work. And that other work is, has always been to push us to the margins if we want to stay Indigenous or be Aboriginal or to assimilate us and make them like them. It's this last slide, almost there, um, about language mobilisation. I guess the point I want to make here is that more than anything else for me, I came from a very political home. I came from a home that spoke of politics on a day-to-day -day basis. I should have said that that photo right at the beginning of my great-grandmother, she was a foundational member of the Australian Labor Party when the Australian Labor Party was, it was actually a sort of a socialist party. She was an Aboriginal woman who started off 
the trade union movement for shearers in the 1890s. She was a, a card-carrying member of the Communist Party in the 1930s. She saw that it was going to be through politics that we were going to be able to get some sort of salvation in terms of being able to sort of throw off the yoke of being colonised. Whether she was right or wrong, but I came from a home where politics was spoken about. I understand now that the work of language and language mobilisation is about sovereignty. It goes directly to the heart of our own resistance. The use of language on a day-to-day -day basis, even just a few words, is, is a statement of resistance. And so, do I feel um, sad that we don't have as much language as I see here in Canada? Yes, I do. But when these girls get up and I see them dance and they speak about that, Yeah, they're resisting as well. They're doing what they can do. And so, to finish off, I just want to, you know, thank you for uh, the opportunity, I guess, to... It's been a, a very quick tour through my thinking in terms of um, the importance of language and culture. It's, it's absolutely central to the work that I want to do. And as I move towards um, putting forward this model, it's to understand that, that um, language and culture is going to be at the heart of what we do. And it might not be what you have here at the moment, but in the sense of being able to enact culture on a day-to-day -day basis, I've seen the impact that it has. You know, it's about co-leadership with our, our, our families and our communities. I should have said that you know one of the amazing things was that that even these young young adults who didn't really understand the notion of what elders could really do, they never experienced it, but they had a yearning for that sort of that leadership from older people in their community to take them in and to speak and talk to them about what was important. The students and the parents spoke over and again about the need for a vision. They wanted a vision. They want a vision that resonates with them and comes from them and represents their aspirations. They're not there yet, but they want to speak about that. And the other thing that they spoke about was that they wanted to hold the government, I guess, and its agents, and they see schools as being part of that, the agents of government, to be accountable to us as Indigenous people. So I wanted to leave on that more positive note than maybe what I thought I was going to take you in the first place, but there were positive messages through this. But it's a long, hard journey for us. And, um, you know, but we also want to be part of that bigger, bigger journey with you and come here to recharge and to lift ourselves up and go home and take up that mantle again. So thank you so much for giving me that opportunity to, to talk to you today.